All right. Well, good morning, everyone. If you're just joining us, we'll be starting in just about a minute or two. So welcome to the Stormwater Awareness Week workshop on low impact development and green infrastructure by Mitch Whitson. Uh, he's uh, presented in workshops before for Stormwater Awareness Week, and it's always been a highlight. So it is 11 o'clock, and I want to give Mitch as much time as possible. So Mitch, uh, if you tell everybody a little bit about yourself and your organization, and that it, it's all yours. Oh, great. Okay. Um, yeah, t I'll tend to, that's part of the presentation, so I'll, I'll make life simple. Um, hi. <laughs> I'm so used to not, I'm so used to not having my face shown, so it's, uh, uh, it's like, uh oh, people are watching. Uh, anyway, so my name is Mitch Whitson. Uh, I'll jump forward real quick. Um, this is part of an AIA uh, presentation that we have. Okay, what's going on with this? It's not jumping forward. Oh, there we go. Okay, so I'll come back and I'll go forward. And I bounce around a little bit. So uh, uh, if I do bounce around, just know I will come back. Um, but, you know, as a brief introduction, you know, we're, we're a little different. Um, in fact, I say we're very different than most people that do this type of thing. Uh, and what I mean by that is um, we're founded as a heavy civil construction management firm. Um, you know, I'm, and I always promote Cal Poly because I go there every quarter and teach some labs on water and water quality. Uh, but, you know, I assume my first job out of college was going to be building houses, but I met my wife at Slow and she transferred to San Jose. So I first job out of college was a highway widening back in the late 1980s to date myself. Um, but I've stayed within that. And I think that the reason I bring forth um, the CM background is, you know, so I've, I've just always done heavy civil private site development, public works contracts kind of across the board. And when you're in this heavy civil market, it is very much like you are always dealing with these sorts of permits. You you know, if you're building a bridge over a waterway, you you got a 404 permit. If you end up doing some habitat uh, restoration or you're taking habitat, then you have a fish and game permit. And then you always have the stormwater permits. And what was happening was back in the early, um, you know, back when I started my business, um, just about 22 years ago, 23 years ago, um, I signed a contract to build about $75 million worth of offsite obligations for a development in San Diego called Flores Ranch, Flores Kelwood. And, you know, then when I did that, um, I really found my niche. And what I mean by that is as there's a difference between being a contractor and being a construction manager. As a construction manager or as a contractor, you're you have a task and that's to make money. Uh, and, you know, and you want to make that money as much as you can for the people that are hiring you because that's what they expect. When you're a construction manager, you are watching after the interests of the owner. You are watching after the, in, the interests of your customers. And when I do a presentation on construction management, I talk about our customers. And, you know, yes, I have a contract with Boris Ranch to build this development. But my customers are also the city, uh, SDG&E, the water boards, uh, transportation facilities, the HOAs. And, and, you know, so your customers aren't cut off just by the guy who writes you a check. I mean, because if you are not fulfilling the obligations or fulfilling, you know, meeting everyone's expectations, you're not doing your job. So I take the CM aspect of work very seriously. And I believe as a company, uh, if anyone does you know, is interested. And I think if we ever do work together, I think you'll like what we bring. And what we bring is we're watching after your interests. And it sounds weird, but you'll see in this presentation that we can. Um, and that's, like I said, that's vastly different than being a construction contractor. Um, so as a CM, you know, we are here to fulfill the obligations of the developer, but also satisfy the obligations of all the agencies that we represent also. So I knew that that was finite. I knew that, you know, I had about five or six years worth of work. And when I was building a road on Black Mountain called Forest um, on Carmel Valley Road, the developer on the other side of a creek pumped out, not the developer, but the contractor dumped some desiltation basins into the creek. And then there was a farmer downstream 
that had been under enforcement action from the water boards for you know farming too close to the creek and some chemicals and fertilizers. I didn't know the specifics, but basically, if he's not allowed to dump in the creek, how come this developer upstream can? So <clears throat> when they got in trouble, you know, they got shut down. You know, when you really push the envelope with the water boards, the water boards ultimately can issue a thing called a claim up and abatement order. And that is a red tag. You're done. You're not working. So, you know, it took quite a bit of money and several months to get back up and running because now you under the microscope. And, and my recommendation is don't ever get in trouble because if you think it's a pain now to do what we're having to do to keep the waters clean, just think what happens when you're under the microscope of everybody. So anyways, so back in 2005, six, seven, um, because we were doing the water board, we were on the other side of the creek, the developer on the other side, and the water board kind of saw what we were up to and said, hey, you know, you're taking this seriously. We'd really like to get some input. So we started our environmental stormwater compliance division back in 2007, uh, about two years prior to the construction general permit. Uh, coincidentally, the construction general permit came on right when the economy all fell apart back in 2008, 9, and 10. Uh, so we went from 60 some odd employees and six, seven million dollars in revenues to six employees and less than a million dollars in revenue. But we stayed open. We paid our bills. So but that's when we founded our stormwater compliance division. So we started off initially doing construction stormwater compliance. Um, in fact, a couple of things we did right off the bat was uh, enforcement mitigation. Uh, so the Sprinter Rail is a light rail between Escondido and Oceanside, California. Uh, that was under a cleanup and abatement action um, by the water boards, but they didn't get shut down. Um, but, you know, they were under violation for 15 months before we came in. And again, I hearken back to the CM side of it. You know, for 15 months, they're out of compliance with the water board. We actually worked directly for the attorneys. But we've got 22 miles of track, 44 miles of right away, 100% compliant with the permit in three months. And I think that's really where what I'm talking about, because if we aren't, if you're writing reports and not doing anything to actually mitigate something that needs to be fixed, you're not doing anything. And I think that's the difference is, is we are going to keep you compliant. Uh, but we're going to keep you compliant by taking action and actually, you know, having you install what needs to be installed so we don't pollute. Uh, so construction stormwater compliant turned into industrial and municipal stormwater compliance. And when we're in that industrial municipal space, it's all about treatment systems. So we shortly thereafter, well, so we do heavy civil CM. We're an engineering general contractor. Uh, again, unlike most of our true competition, we are a design build firm. So if you want us to design the system, then ultimately go out there and build it. We can because we're an A licensed engineering general contractor. Um, so we do quite a bit of design build stormwater treatment systems. And as we kind of go through this today, um, I think you'll see some of the things that we're up to. And, you know, I hope you like what we're up to. But the bottom line is we're here to help. So. If we can help, if you, you know, you get my contact information off of this, if somebody references the word stormwater, feel free to call me because um, we'll always be there to help. And I think that's what our customers like about us. So how did I get into this? Well, we had a contract with the city of Thousand Oaks and, and, you know, it was a pretty interesting contract. We were helping them figure out some stormwater aspects. Uh, and one of the first things they want us to do in the Malibu watershed, they had to go zero trash. So what is the technology? What are people doing? How are they going zero trash? Well, the bottom line is in order you to go zero trash, you need some type of connector pipe screen down inside that catch basin. Uh, or if it's a curve, if it's a traditional catch basin, you've got to do something to capture that five millimeter or less um, object, cigarette butts or whatever. So you would just put a connector pipe screen inside of a catch basin and everything's good. But what happens if you simply take a trash guard or a Fabco trash unit or any of these other technologies, you put them in the catch basin, the maintenance costs for the municipality are going to skyrocket. And the reason is, is now you're capturing all that debris inside the catch basin. Well, the city had a pretty, you know, uh, they had a street sweeping program, so they would get most of the trash on the surface. 
And what people had done was they were doing a thing called an automatic retractable screen. Um, <clears throat> a bunch of nonsense, in my opinion. Again, one other thing you're going to see with me is I'm opinionated. So if, um, again, call me if you don't like what I'm saying, um, but I will tell you my opinion on it as well. So automatic retractable screens were a mess. Uh, we went out and looked at well over 100 uh, in Orange County in LA, and about 68% of them were either gone, missing, damaged, stuck open, stuck closed. And so we're looking at a technology we really didn't like. Uh, you had to do something at the curb face because if you didn't, then again, your maintenance costs are going to skyrocket. Then we figured out that, okay, not only are these you know automatic retractable screens ridiculous, they're also very expensive. So we're looking at the problem and trying to solve that financial problem for the city. And we found out that we could see up in this right-hand mirror here, this right-hand image, we built our own small little trash interceptor. It's about half the height of the curb face. We would redhead it into the apron, but also connect it to each other. And we were able to cut more than two thirds out of that budget and solve the problem because now all the large leaf and debris and trash are being captured at the curb face. The street sweeping operation is taking care of it. Um, but yeah, they did. They had no increase in, in the overall maintenance costs and we were able to solve their problem to go zero trash. So yes, sometimes cheap is, I don't, I, I don't like the word cheap because that's not what we're trying to do. Inexpensive. So sometimes simple is an easier solution than complicated so, yeah, it's a pretty simple technology, and we still do it quite a bit on projects. Um, from that experience, we found some uh, technologies we really like from the East Coast. Uh, an organization called Convergent Water Technologies was a great source. Uh, Fabco Industries is a great company. And we found these people that were not in California that had great products that helped us kind of solve some of these problems. So... We found a California filtration specialist. We're coming on our 10th year. Um, yeah, we do quite a bit of stormwater. So if we could help again, reach out. So what are we trying to do? You know, that's the bottom line. You know, we're trying to replicate the hydraulic cycle. We're trying to basically capture that precipitation, allow that water to go into the ground, reduce the amount of runoff from leaving the property, and there's a million reasons why we do that. But what we really are truly trying to do is to kind of replicate that natural process, recharge the groundwater. Soils do a great job of treating pollutants as water's running through them. And so, okay, how are we doing? Well, horribly, you know, because what did we do? Well, we decided to pave over our aquifers. Um, so in the Los Angeles basin in LA County, there was a, a, a measure W was passed a few years ago and by the voters, not by the politicians. And what it does is it's a, if I recall properly, it's a two and a half cent tax on all private properties, impervious surfacing. And 100% of that money goes to measure W projects for public agencies to be able to now implement low impact development technologies, infiltration systems. Uh, we've had the benefit of working with some engineers on some of these Measure W projects. Uh, we're looking forward to a couple interesting projects that hopefully will hit the ground here in the next year or so. And we'll talk about those later. But yeah, you pave over your asphalt and or you pave over that dirt, what's going to happen? Well, <laughs> you know, even clay, because people have this mentality, it's like clay doesn't part. Okay, I get it. But look at this difference between, you know, a rainfall amount and a roof or large impervious surfacing. You know, we are about 99% of that water is leaving that property. However, even in clay, like hard clay materials, you are having less than half of that water leave your property. Because even though it doesn't quote unquote perk, it does slowly, it does ultimately infiltrate um, so even in pre-development and post-development runoff, water is going to leave that property. Certainly if you just put asphalt in the ground and kind of go, hey, what's wrong? So um, soils have a big part of it too. Uh, so when we're doing soils, what type of soils are there? So on the design team, uh, one of the first things that I always say when I'm talking to the engineers that we work with quite frequently to 
come up with technology, coming up with solutions to that, the first thing you need to do is get an infiltration test. And I can't tell you how many times we've been into a meeting and somebody goes, you know, it's like, all right, well, first things first, what are your infiltration rates? What can we do with this water? And, and I get the canned response. It's like, oh yeah, it doesn't flow. Well, does it not flow or does it flow just a little? And there's a huge difference because you can, if you have some even very small infiltration rate, that allows you to keep water out the bottom of the tank. It allows you to do something with some of that latent waters after the, you know, after your storage system or after your, you know, when it gets through the weir. So there is a huge difference between no infiltration and some infiltration. And just like we looked at this model is the runoff coefficients and even hard clay soils is half of what it is for asphalt. So we need to know not only the type of soil, but we do want there to be, give us some good infiltration rates because that opens up the options of how we're going to manage this water. So if you look at California and you're just saying, okay, what's the difference between, you know, look at the groundwater levels, look at what happens here in the state in relation to the impervious surfacing that is present, where we have a, an abundance of impervious surfacing, it happens to directly relate to where we're having groundwater issues. Fortunately, in the last couple of years in California, we've had some good snows. We've had some good wet winters, but we don't know when we're going to get those wet winters. And most importantly, you don't know where you're going to get them. So the bulk of the water that we get in California is a result of that atmospheric river. Some people call it a pineapple express, but you know, one year, and I always you look at the Oroville Dam, you know, about a decade ago, there was so much water up there that that dam was on the on the brink of failure. So they're draining the reservoir, they're doing everything they can because they got so much water in that area, they had to do something with it. And it was damaging that dam. And then two years later, it's empty. So again, it's a you don't know where that water is going to hit. Sometimes it hits in Southern California, sometimes it hits in Northern California, but it doesn't necessarily hit the state uniformly. Uh, and, and anyone who lives here knows that. So we have to really do the best we can. So we have a runoff issue. We have a, a volume issue. But what about the water quality side of it? So what are we doing on the water quality side? So I actually, I, I like to be a, um, you know, people go, you're always bashing on LA and we paved over our water. But, you know, not really. I mean, th there's water quality issues throughout the state. In fact, with the new permits, and certainly if anyone's not familiar with the new 22 CGP for the state of California, let's talk. Uh, and the reason we need to talk is because the new 22 permit, much like the industrial general permit, the 22 construction permit is tying us to the receiving water bodies. And so you could simply open up a map, you could see where you're gonna build, you can see the 303D list water bodies and you can see what the impairments are for those water bodies. And we need to do something to not allow the pollutants of concern to make it to those water bodies. So here's a good example. Uh, the LA River is impaired for metals. So in the LA River, you know, if you have a project that is discharging ultimately to the LA River and the LA River is impaired for metals, Guess what can't leave your property? Metals. What construction site does not have iron on it? I don't think there's a single one. So we need to understand what the receiving water body's impairments are before we just go out and design a project and say, hey, it's all the same. Because it's not all the same. We're having to deal with specific TMDL, 303D list water bodies on a case-by-case -case basis. So it's not one thing fits all anymore. It, it hasn't been like that for a while. So I always look about, again, how are we doing? So I happen to live in the Central Valley of California. Um, you go up to Yosemite, you look at the Merced River and you're like, oh, pristine, gorgeous, beautiful. And then you come down the Merced River past all the agricultural lands, plus past all the farmings. And that Merced River starts to look like it is in those other two pictures. That's just across the street from where our house is, we live, you know, basically on the Merced River. So we need, so on a runoff reduction side, we're not doing a very good job. 
And on the water quality side, we're doing a better job, but still not as good as we can. So we need to do better. No, oh, thanks. Um, my apologies. Uh, so when we're looking at runoff reduction, you could look at post-development, pre-development runoff. And so what are we seeing? When you're looking at the pre-development runoff, a certain amount of water leaves that property, and that is kind of played out over time, the length of the storm. So then you look at the post-development, pre-development runoff, and then you go back to where we were, you know, a decade or more ago when you had to try to get pre- and post-development runoff to equalize. Well, now you must equalize pre- and post-development runoff. Uh, but if you use low impact development and green infrastructure thoughts and processes, you are getting as close to traditional pre-development runoff coefficient than you do on tra with traditional controls. So you, again, LID, green infrastructure, will ultimately get you as close as you were to pre-development, but it's also the most efficient and it is by far the cheapest way to approach water you know, quality. So I look at this world pretty blank. I just, I look at it differently than most um, because I look at it purely from a runoff reduction perspective and a water quality perspective. Uh, when we get into traditional bioretention basins, and I'll tear those apart in a minute, um, you know, you're trying to force a water quality and a runoff reduction components, and they're just different. You know, they do vary. So when I'm dealing with engineers or architects or municipalities or designers or builders, and you have to take those two concepts separately. So a tank is a tank is a tank. And I know there's some people out there, there's a, there's a couple people that, you know, if you can't walk in a tank, you cannot maintain, maintain that tank. And that's just a fallacy. That's not true. Uh, but, you know, does it withhold the structural loads above it? Does it withhold, does it support, sorry, does it support the loading above? And that's a strength conversation. So does it support or does it not support? So the tank is a tank is a tank is a tank. Yes, there are advantages of concrete. So yeah, if you're under, if you're over 10 feet deep, it's just better to do a concrete tank because of the strength. But if you're up to 10 feet deep, there are modular technologies that are a fraction of the cost of concrete that will support those loads. So again, water reduction, runoff reduction, and then there's a water quality side of it. And, you know, when it is kind of, you know, again, I'm opinionated and I think it's silly, but, you know, for example, well, I'll get into retention systems. And is it tape only? So tape is technology assessment protocol ecology out of the state of Washington. Um, so there are municipalities that it is tape. And if you don't, if you deviate from a traditional basin, you must have your tape certification. There are other municipalities that want to see that tape. So if you have tape, it's basically a rubber stamp for you to get your permit because all the vetting of the technology has occurred. And I get it. You know, we do quite a bit of work with various municipalities and some municipalities are not going to deviate. They want tape only and that's the way it is. And I get it. You know, I wouldn't want to mess with it either. But at the same time, there are other conventions, there are other technologies and assessment tech, you know, assessment protocols that can prove whether or not that technology is going to meet the standards they want. So let's take a step to the side. What are we trying to do? We're trying to infiltrate. Well, why don't we want to infiltrate? Well, because it recharges the aquifer and it treats the pollutants. So several engineering friends of mine have said, as, as shallow as eight foot below a septic system with you had good organic soils, that water, that soil, that root uptake, that anaerobic bacteria action will scrub those pollutants from leaving that water body or leaving that septic system and groundwater is groundwater. So, you know, I have a well and I have a septic system. So our water is amazing. Um, but you know, there's a few more feet, but we want to infiltrate because that, you know, in my mind, the state of California, you should never build a dam. Why would you spend a billion plus dollars building dams and taking habitat when if you actually just started implementing low impact development technology, you can get all the water you need from an annual rainstorm. Uh, but 
again, we paved over our aquifers. So what if you can't infiltrate? Well, dry wells. Well, quite honestly, I don't like dry wells. Um, and the reason I don't like dry wells is because they're not maintained. And it also reduces, reduces the flow path of the pollutants closer to the, the uh, groundwater area. So if they were maintained, then okay, I, I get it. I understand. But they're also costly. You know, we're spending $25,000, $30,000 on a dry well that will work for a while. But if you're not maintaining it, then it's not going to work. Uh, we do control some technologies. This is very interesting. It's a, it's a company called Exelterra, and they have a product called JEPS, which is Ground Energy Passive System. And in essence, what you, what you look at, the easiest way to think about JEPS is when you take these 5s, 10s, 20s, and 40s, and if you look at the picture on the left-hand side, we're not puncturing holes in strata and allowing that water to flow up and down that tubule. What's happening, if you look at the one that's on the far bottom right corner compared to the one in the far upper left corner, these units, when you drill a hole, you put them into the ground, as the water, as pressure below surface is greater, it'll squeeze that little bit of tube so you get some relief of that high pressure. In the areas where you have ground pressure, I mean low pressure, that tubule expands ever so slightly. And when you put these into a pattern, in a basin or below a tank, you actually can create infiltration and impermeable surfacing. Uh, we did a project a couple of years ago in Stockton, uh, hard clay, just clay, like no water is going to flow through it clay. Uh, we built a 25,000 cubic foot tank. Uh, we installed this technology below that tank. And in hard clay, we have a 25,000 cubic foot tank draining every 24 to 30 hours. Um, and the reason I say that is because we'll check one day, it'll be raining, the tank is completely full. We come out the next day and that tank is completely dry. So we are doing things with water that most people aren't. Uh, it's a neat technology. Uh, please reach out, but we can create infiltration and permeability by rebalancing the pressures below surface. So you, when you rebalance the pressures below grade, water starts to flow. And when water starts to flow, you get infiltration. Uh, there was a uh, similar technology that was, um, Exoterra controls the technology. There was a group called Parjana that had the, tech, the license rights to that not too long ago. Um, but Anyways, they did a project for the city of Fresno and early in the process in 2,500 days, they infiltrated about 30 acre feet. In a 10th of the time they infiltrated, they created more than twice the infiltration rate. So the technology does work. And when you're building, if you have a choice between a building a massive tank with no infiltration or building a smaller tank and creating infiltration, that's where this model makes a lot of sense. All right. So if we can't infiltrate, then we do bioretention. So <clears throat> again, <clears throat> sorry, um, I don't like the term bioretention. And the reason is, is you're taking two completely separate contacts, con concepts. One is a runoff retention, retention, volume reduction, and they tie to it a water quality, but those two aspects are not necessarily um, there. They don't have to coexist. They don't have to be connected at the at the hip. And so, for example, we built a basin at a winery. Sorry, I've got a tickle in my throat. Um, so we had an industrial facility. Um, it was a winery. They were making wine. They're signatory to the industrial permit. They wanted to put a traditional bioretention basin because they didn't want to go down the road of a proprietary product. And what is bioretention basin in this region? Well, it's sand mixed with compost or sand mixed with topsoil. What happens when compost breaks down, when it gets dry and it kind of dries up? Well, it releases nitrates and nitrogen. So we're building a wine, we're building a winery that is using fertilizers and using, you know, organic chemicals on their property. We're tying them to a basin that we have made that will actually release nitrates and nitrogen. Why would we do that? 
you know, I get it. I mean, because it's simple and it's cheap, but at the same time, you're putting a system in the ground that's going to exacerbate your problem. It makes no sense. So you do have a basin size, but you don't have to go five inches an hour. The water quality side, we we're just talking about tape. So, you know, for a traditional bioretention basin, they didn't have to go up to the state of Washington and do a test and get approved. They just said, oh, wow, if you give me a certification letter that says it's a mixture of sand and compost, you're good. Rubber stamp, which again, it's ridiculous. But if you go with a proprietary product that has to go through the study, that has to go through the state of Washington, you're proving that that technology works. So again, there's a double standard. So you do need to do that, but they're not dependent upon one another. So why would we not build a small bioretention facility in the parking island of a shopping center and build a tank behind it that is going to handle the runoff reduction side of it? I like modular. I like modular for a lot of reasons. One of the biggest reasons I like modular projects like this, if you see that right side of the picture, we're cruising along, we're building a tank system, we get a phone call, the water line that was supposed to be below my tank is now in the middle of my tank. So if this was a, an arch system or a pipe system or a concrete vault system, what do you think happens when you end up having a water line go right through the middle of your system? Well, that job shut down. They're going to have to stop the job. The engineers are going to have to design a solution. They're going to have to reach out to people like us to get, you know, because we control the product. How are we going to fix it? We're modular. Make a difference. Split the tank, protect the pipe, met with the city. City bought the concept. They were back up and running in an hour. So a modular gives you a flexibility you don't get with other products. And yes, for the people that are on this phone call that feel you have to be able to walk inside of a tank, I apologize, you don't. You put enough maintenance ports, you put enough inspection ports, you could easily flush water through a system and vacuum out the sediment on the other side. But most importantly, you create a system that's going to pre-treat that water before it goes into the tank. So... Again, high flow biofiltration reduces the footprint, allows the architect to preserve his design. I don't know if how many architects are on the phone or landscape architects have been on the call, but how many times have you had this great design and all of a sudden someone comes in and says, oh, I don't think so. You're going to have to build this. Well, okay. I mean, do you really? So high flow biofiltration. Ask the same question you ask about anything else. Does it reduce the costs? And my second question is, why are we living in a concrete world? And, and I get it, you know, because I think a lot of the competition that we're dealing with, that's when you put something in a concrete vault, it takes a $5,000 biofiltration system and turns it into a twenty-five dollars or $30,000 tank. So as a manufacturer, sure, I get it. More money, more profit, good. But in the real world, why? Why would we do that? Why would we spend $30,000 on concrete when you're trying to get a biofiltration that will sit inside of the landscaping of that property. Um, go out to Hotel Dell in, in San Diego, California. I think we have 17 systems out there. You know, you could probably find them and you could find them because we have an overflow. But if you don't have that overflow, you're not going to see it. And the reason is, is we're not building this big giant concrete vault next to where we want to put a biofiltration. So, why are we building pods in concrete tanks? It makes no sense to me. All right. So if you can't infiltrate and you can't find some type of high flow biofiltration or you cannot do a bioretention system, then we can go down the road of filtration. Filtration is a very site-specific, pollutant-specific model. Uh, but there's some cool technology out there. There's some great technology out there. Uh, so, but it's again, a pollutants flow and site specific mechanism. And what are we trying to do? So are we going to buy some filter fabrics and witch's hat and just go and go, oh yeah, wow, let's do this. Yeah. Let's put some stainless steel in the catch basin. That's going to get destroyed as soon as they try to vacuum it out or better yet, let's put a piece of filter fabric in there and act like that's actually going to treat metals leaving your property. It's not. So just don't be penny wise and pound, pound foolish. Um, I like Fabco's technology. I think Fabco's got some pretty cool things. Uh, they actually have a product called FabGuard, which is a certified antibacterial filter. Um, and so if you're trying to address bacteria, um, I'm only aware of the one product. You know, we do biocarbons. I, I do quite a bit of biocarbon, actually. 
I can treat bacteria, but I'm sequestering that bacteria. So I'll never get certified because you just can't. So on the Fabco side, their technology actually kills the bacteria. So that's why they have a certification for bacteria filters. I also like their product because we can retrofit catch basins virtually any size. We have a cartridge-based technology system that they will design depending on the pollutants they have. And it's durable. So you could beat the heck out of it. You could replace these cartridges as you need. And it's not going to be destroyed when you put it in the ground. So again, I know there's several different types of filter technology. Um, yeah, I just, I happen to like the Fabco. Just I'm familiar with their products. and familiar, familiar with their brand. So, but again, if we can help, just reach out and we're going to give you something that's a solid recommendation. All right. So um, are we... Another core concept, and I, I thank Scott Gourneau for developing this exhibit or whoever developed this exhibit, but I like it. Um, so traditionally, what are we doing? Well, you know, for the civil engineers out there, you're doing a hydraulic grade line and you're like, okay, how big does the catch basin have to be on the front side? Forest given rain event that goes into a certain size pipe that goes into another pipe that goes into another pipe. And then we put it into a giant septic system, which is a shallow flat system but more importantly, you're taking land. So why are we why are we taking a lot, turning it into a basin, turning it into a septic field? When if you take this core concept of decentralization, you don't have to put all that pipe in the ground. You don't have to have all those catch basins. You could easily take a, a non-box version biofiltration system and put it on a lot by lot basis. We're doing a project in, uh, we do a lot of these where we're doing you know, 20, 30, 40 biofiltration cells on a given property. And we're doing tank systems right below those biofiltration cells. And we're eliminating all the storm drain system on the property. Uh, we do, we try to do this as much as we can. Some things work, some things do very well, uh, but there's others that don't, but we do truly attempt to reduce and eliminate storm drain systems. And if we've got good percolation, if we've got good infiltration, there's no reason we need to go with a traditional storm drain system. We could simply go with a good permeable solution. So I'm not rambling too bad so far. So traditional permeable surfacing is horrible. Um, it, well, yeah, I mean, I don't like it. I'll, I'll just be honest. In fact, we just left the property in Vista in which they built, built these uh, trench drains out of permeable concrete. And it's been there for about five or six years and it's an industrial facility. So what happened with that permeable concrete? It doesn't flow. The water just runs over the top and then tries to find the next aspect out. So you have a very small pore space. You know, in other regions of the country, I think permeable asphalt and permeable concrete will be a solid technology. But in the Southwest United States, we get about four or five months of dust. Uh, well, sorry, we get about four months of rain. Uh, we get about eight months of dust. And then when it starts to rain, we get that first rain event like it did last week in Northern California. We got, oh, wow, it's 50% chance of a hundredth of an inch of rain. Oh, it's three hundredths of an inch of rain. There's another hundredth of an inch. And then all of a sudden it's like, boom, we get that one inch rainstorm. We get that two inch rainstorm. We get that you know three quarter inch. And again, that goes back to that atmospheric river. So we're going to have dust, 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 dust. We're going to have a sprinkling of water. What is that going to do with this system? It's going to clog it. Of course, it's going to clog it. So even the Brookings, in Brookings Institute states that infiltration rates of porous asphalt and concrete will exceed 2,000 inches an hour. However, those long-term rates are going to be as low as two inches per hour. And then think about what we're doing to this permeable concrete. You know, There's nothing holding that concrete together. So how many times have we gone out to properties and we see this porous concrete and you see where the guys are turning their wheels and that porous concrete is turning into dust. So you're putting a system in the ground that you know is gonna fail and it's ultimately never gonna do what it's supposed to do. So it makes no sense, but you know we keep doing it. We do it all the time. Uh, so 
there are things that you like to do. We do like to do permeable, you know, permeable blocks, architectural units. Um, but again, you need to generally rake some sand in. You need to have a binding curb all the way around. You have a two or three pound block that sits on a bedding sand, that sits on a base material, that sits on a, a, a rock system that ends up going into a French drain that ultimately is going to clog. So, all right, so we're doing asphalt, we're doing concrete, and we're doing permeable surfacing, all of which are going to fail. Oh, and we're spending a lot of money to do it. So you, you can pave a parking lot, say, 3 to $5 a square foot, depending on where the plant is and depends on the square footage of the asphalt. Um, but if you, as soon as you go into a permeable block system, you're, you're talking 10 to $15 installed. Um, so you're spending a lot of money doing something that's ridiculous. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that going with a permeable system that's not going to fail is a bad decision. So here's a project we did a few years ago. The issue with this job was we basically had to treat the waters as fast as it came to my systems. Um, so we needed 250 square feet of focal point. As fast as the water got there, that's the size we needed to be able to treat. And then we went into a modular tank system, a, a system called our tank, went underneath the asphalt parking lot. And what happened was I couldn't make the invert elevations work. So by the time I got through the focal point, which is about 30 inches, I can go a little smaller if we want. Then I went into a tank system and then that tank system got to the storm drain system. I was below the invert of the storm drain. So then we ended up having to do a pump system on top of it. So I'm already spending 95 grand just on material. And now I'm going to have to build it a $35,000 pump system and the electrical to provide that pump system. So it immediately became cost prohibitive. So we're trying to deal with invert elevations. And what I ended up seeing was we have a, a product called Pave Drain. Um, we said, what happens if we put that bathtub on the front end? How about if we store on the front end? create a large ponding area, create void space in front of the biofiltration. And I was purely doing it from an invert elevation perspective. But what it allowed us to do was A, reduce that outflow. So now I'm above the invert elevation leaving the property. And even though we're replacing that asphalt with a much more expensive product, look what it did to the biofiltration size. I'm about a 10%, you know, maybe about 15% of what I had to do at 200 square feet. Now I'm 35 square feet. And I ended up having to, now it A, works, and B, the biofiltration, the system works as a whole, but I cut about 55% of the money out of the contract, even though I'm replacing asphalt with a much more expensive system. So if you're thinking permeable, think permeable that's going to work, but also think permeable that is actually going to function. And when you tie it to stormwater management, it becomes affordable. So we work with a couple systems. Uh, one is called Pave Drain. Um, you know, it's we actually have a, a very large project coming um, this year. We're going to be well, probably end up going to twenty five. Uh, in which we're building all of the roads of the you know all the infrastructure out of a permeable surfacing. And because when the engineers started looking at storm drain systems in relation to basins, in relation to everything else, they were losing land, they were losing lots, and they're spending a bunch of money. And what they figured out is that void space below the paved drain block, if you increase that to 19 inches, we now have storage underneath all our roadways. So paved drain works. Uh, we have projects in Stottsdale, Arizona that had been there for seven, eight years, uh, never been maintained, and it still flows at over 1,500 inches per hour per square foot. If you're in California and you're, you know, central California, you know where Pinecrest Lake is, same thing. We built a parking lot, you know, up in the mountains. So think about that. Scottsdale, Arizona, where it's just dust, dust, desert, and the High Sierras, where it's pine needle, pine needle, you know, clog. Two systems that are flowing at well over 1,000 inches per hour per square foot. And it's because of the design. It's a solid concrete block with a quarter inch spacer. But what do we do? Well, we're doing streetscapes. We're doing sidewalks. We're doing parking stalls. And you don't have to do the entire thing 
at this flow rate, we will frequently put in a trench drain. So instead of a valley gutter where you're spending $25 a, a square foot for a seven inch concrete valley gutter, why not replace that valley gutter with the paved drain system, put that water into the ground? So it works and it, and it, you know, some people don't like the, the block, but you get the same color palette you do out of any dry pack concrete plant. Uh, it's a solid product and it, and it works. And again, we'll do crosswalks out of it. We'll do roadways out of it. We'll do sidewalks out of it. Uh, we're doing, we did a design just this last year where we created a three foot uh, trench drain effectively all the way around the property and the water sheet flows into the trench drain, goes into a, well, goes into the paved drain system, which is in a sense, essence a trench drain, and we have perforated pipes below it. So yeah, it's it's a solid product, ADA compliant, but now we're eliminating catch basins. Now we're eliminating storm drain systems. Now we're eliminating hydrodynamic separators. And I get it. There's people on this call that are going, I don't like Pervious. They're not going to convince me of it otherwise, but I'm just saying that it works. And, and it's a pretty solid system. So, and to maintain it, you don't have to get crazy. You could simply get an Elgin street vac, a whirlwind Elgin will vacuum out all the debris from inside that system. If you have a system that is even more inundated, there's a vac head we can create with a, with a vac truck. And it's basically like a lawnmower, but it sprays high pressure water into the joints. And right below that is a vac coming out of the vac. So you basically are doing a vector cleaning of the pavement. And um, Joe, uh, Doug Book's got a really cool study uh, University of Southern Florida, where they basically tried to clog their system purposely, took a bunch of dirt, we'll put it on a paved drain system, wet it down, broomed in all that into the joints, and then used the the vacuum style, and it got back to 97% of what is original infiltration rate. So not all the time, you know, you, permeable doesn't work in any instances, in every instance, but there are instances in which this technology works. And again, if you're cutting out storm drain systems and you've got a good permeable soil, why are you building catch basins anyways? And you know, I some people out there are going, well, because it, let's say there's let's say there's an oil leak, let's say a car is sitting there and you know they drop some oil. Well, this system, you can pick these blocks out individually. You can pick the blocks out, you could clean up that area, you can put the crushed rock back in and put the paved drain right back in place. So these can be maintained and there are. So um, there's another product that I love. Um, I love EcoRester. Uh, and the reason I like EcoRester is because of its price point and its functionality and what it does. So it is a U.S. military uses it all over the world. We have a big equine market with it because it's a low density polyethylene. It'll never crack. It'll never split so that you have the potential for a horse getting cut, which you don't want. Some people spend a lot of money on horses, uh, but it's a low density polyethylene grid. Uh, it's made out of recycled plastic shopping bags bound with a resin. Uh, so you have a sustainable product. It's not 100% recycled plastic shopping bags, but the vast majority of the plastic in the system is recycled plastic. Uh, it is interesting. Uh, and the reason I like it is we, through a grant in the state of California, we were able to prove that the E40 version, there's an E50, which is 50 millimeters thick, and there's an E40 version, which is 40 millimeters thick. The E40 supports over 300% the minimum fire track load. So now you have a system that's as inexpensive as asphalt that has, we're going to warranty it for 20 years. It's going to easily support the fire truck loads. And it has the benefit of the same tensile strength of the BX1200. So it'll bridge over a failed surfacing. It'll bridge over soft subgrade. And you can pull this out. You can fix it. You can put it back in without damaging the surfacing itself. So it won't ever get brittle. It won't ever split. It won't ever tail and tear. Um, but it's a solid permeable surface. Don't confuse it for this nonsense um, or this nonsense or this nonsense. You know, these are HDPE products. They will break, they will, they will tear, they will, but you know, I do like hidden structures have done a great job of marketing and conceptually fine, but it's a brittle product and we don't like it. 
or I don't. So if you like it, fine, but I'd rather not have a system that is going to split or tear or break. So what do we do? Uh, temporary access roads. Uh, we do quite a bit of this uh, because you don't need the rock structural, you don't need the structural strength from the rock bed below it. You can just lay this on, lay this on ground and start driving on it. And it's going to support driving on top of it. You install it simply. Um, there's exploration companies that do this where they'll put this on, a, you know, get it out, lay it, do its thing. At the end of the job, they simply unzip it, pre palletize it, take it to the next job. Uh, it's fantastic for temporary construction access in bad areas. Uh, I would recommend doing it because it's something you could use year after year after year after year versus how many times have you had a muddy site and you had to pave part of that muddy site just to have to tear that asphalt out a year from now because you haven't done all your utilities. Why would you ever do that? Use this. It'll bridge over that soft material. Typically what we'll do if we don't have a good granular soil underneath we will actually, we want the water to go somewhere because we're doing this from a managing, you know, water management perspective. So we're going to dig a structural section. We're going to put down a geotextile. We're going to put a minimal amount of three quarter inch uh, crushed rock below it. And then you're going to lay the eco raster on top. If you can see this drawing, look back up that road real quick and see how the rock section ends and the eco raster goes over that for about two or three feet. Do that. Uh, and the reason is, is we did a job with the County of Merced and the County of Merced was unfamiliar with the technology. So what they wanted us to do is they had us put a uh, basically a one foot rock section below the side of the road and the shoulder backing. Um, we did. But what happened was the skip loader was seven foot wide. We put a six foot wide strip of eco raster down. And all these truck drivers see this like, oh, wow, there's somewhere I can turn around. And they would hang a U-turn. Their tire would get between the grid and the dirt where I had that foot, that foot of rock. And what it did is it started lifting the grid up. Uh, didn't damage the grid. We simply unzipped it, laid it back down, and then added two more rows so that that last row of grid was sitting on just dirt. It wasn't on that one foot rock section, but you know, we do shoulder backings. We do access roads. We do drivable grasses. We do parking lots. Uh, you can see, we kind of put it wherever we want to put it. So why again, are we doing asphalt? Why are we doing concrete when you could do something like this at a fraction of the cost? Um, if you're ever up in the Central Valley of California, go find Dust Bowl Brewing. They got good beer, good food, and you'll see our parking lots made out of the eco raster with a pea gravel fill. Uh, we've got a couple jobs in the Bay Area coming where we're doing a drivable grass. Uh, we do quite a bit of this in the Pacific Northwest where you get, you know, you want a drivable grass. You don't, you know, you don't want to pave your driveways as much as you can get away from it. Um, so, Access road, industrial roads. We at Ontario Airport, we actually have some trench drains made out of this product that they drive forklifts on every single day, and it's been there for a number of years, and it's not going anywhere. Um, the picture on the bottom left, we drove fourteen thousand truckloads on eco raster on one foot of crushed rock, um, and at the end of it, we lost about three percent of the product, um, but we had a full container of it, and we again thousands and thousands of truckloads on this grid. Temporary construction access, again, it's it's durable as all heck, but it's affordable. So there's a blocks version of it. Um, we can replace and basically it's got the same grid. The flow rate through this, this product is over 5,000 inches per hour, according to Intertech Labs. Um, but we do that, or if you look at the bottom left-hand side, we will fill it with recycled rubber tires. So we could do this blocks version and we put these rubber inserts, um, travelable grass, parking stalls, you know, it looks good. Um, but then the water flows through this like it's going out of style. So you get the ADA compliance and we will fill it full of rubber. So if you want it to look like a parking lot, it's a parking lot. If you want it to be a parking stall, it'll be a parking stall. UV charging cities walking past. Uh, the one thing we're doing, there's a landscape architect buddy of mine and what he wanted was a was a more high end finish. And what we're doing is we're going to build the eco raster. We're going to fill that void with either a pea gravel or a rubber, 
And then we're going to put that half inch of playground servicing on top of the grid. So now you end up having that same good architectural look. You can make it the pellet, you can make the pallet whatever you want, but that now supports fire truck loads. So you can do that too. So permeable doesn't work in every instance, but I think you don't want to close your eyes to permeable. So Mitch, Mitch, yeah. we got about five minutes just to let oh, you know. Oh, wow. I'm, I truly, apologize. I thought I had an hour and a half. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Let me do, uh, I'll blow through this real quick. So uh, tanks, modular tanks. Um, you know, I like modular again, our tank is a solid brand. There's a, there's a lot of people do modular tanks. We have our own called aqua save that we control nationally. Uh, you know, it's you know, as strong as, or more strong than everyone else's modular tank systems. How do we do it? What do we want to do? You know, that depends on what the surface is. If you're going to need a water flush, a, a water tank, you're going to want that water tank to be 30 mil. You're going to want that welded. You want that pressure tested. You want it hold water test. Or are you doing an infiltration system or a never tank system? But again, I like, I like modular. You can make it look like whatever you want. More importantly, you could spend $1.3 million tearing up a parking lot and doing a bunch of, you know, big giant pipes and dry wells and that stuff, or you could pay half the money and a third of the time and build a modular tank system as a design build contractor like we do. You can also go big. We did built a couple of the largest modular tank systems in North America, uh, just shy of 6 million gallons of tanks. From design to installation, we did that less than six months. So you can go big. Uh, Coltec, I like, it's an arch system. Problem with arch systems, in my opinion, not to destroy a, a concept, but if you need that dirt for your pad, you're going to have to bring your asphalt people out in the second mode. And the reason is, is you don't want to just put this foot of rock on top of it, put some geogrid and start driving construction traffic. You don't want to do that. You want to get that structural section made, leave your asphalt shy a tenth of an inch you could overlay later. But, you know, what do we like to do? We like to do tanks where we need them. We like to put permeable on top of it. We like to eliminate 100% of the storm drain system on that project. Uh, focal point is solid. Please reach out to us. Please reach out to Convergent Water Networks. Uh, Ferguson has it also can do this technology. We do quite a bit of it. Let us know. We'll do designs for free. We do have a storm garden system that we use, uh, do quite a bit of it. So if you want a box-based system, reach out, let us know. We do quite a bit of stormwater. Um, so yeah, I'll stop so I can keep going. I truly apologize. I thought it was an hour and a half. So um, I get for rambling. <laughs> well, well, thank you, Mitch. That was great. Um, we do have a couple more minutes. I wanted to just invite um, anyone who might have a question um, to take the last minute or two. Um, I don't see anything in the chat. But okay. if you have a question, unmute yourself, um, and we'd love to field that to Mitch. And and Mitch, I was telling everybody we're going to get a copy of your 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 presentation, a PDF uh, notes, and we'll link it to the website so everybody can download that. Please, um, and if there's any architects, uh, anyone that needs AIA accredited um, education, we work with a nonprofit called Green Technologies. And we have AIA accredited presentations on low impact development, the construction general permit, and we're getting ready to do a new education series, kind of a winter prep, um, talking about the changes in the permit, the 22, and the changes coming in California under phase two permit. So we're here to help. All Whatever right. Whatever we can do, reach out. And I apologize for going long. I shouldn't have rambled at the beginning. Do you, do you have a contact slide? I do. All right. And while he's looking that up, I want to thank all of you for being in this workshop. We have lots of other workshops that you can attend. And uh, thank you for being a part of Stormwater Awareness Week. And uh, if, you, if you like this event, let people know about it. And it's all free. All right. there, There's uh, Mitch's uh, contact information. Yeah, let us help. And John, I apologize. I thought it was uh, it was on my calendar for two hours, so I was taking my time. All right. Well, well, thank you, Mitch. And uh, we'll let everybody log off and go to the next workshop. So thanks, Mitch. Thanks, John. And thank you, everybody that attended. Take care, everyone.